Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Psych 3510. Uh, I'm still at the lovely Hotel Business Center. Um, today, we're going to be starting um, something that we would really call statistics, right? So uh, our frequency uh, distributions and tables um, are about sort of visualizing data. Uh, it falls in that land of descriptive statistics. Uh, but what we're going to talk about today is our first sort of foray into inferential statistics uh, and something that you are would would possibly and be likely to actually see um, in a published experimental uh, paper of some kind. So the way this lecture is going to work, I'm going to introduce uh, the test. Uh, it's called a chi-square. It's not chai, it's chi. Uh, it's It's after the Greek letter for chi. Um, so chi-square, we're gonna discuss what that is when we use it, uh, but then we have to do a little bit of heavy lifting on some very conceptual and theoretical stuff about the way we make decisions in science and using statistics. So in addition to learning our first statistic, uh, we're also learning about the process of hypothesis testing. So that makes this lecture um, uh, sort of a lot of information. It makes this section a lot of information. Uh, please feel free to pause, rewind, rewatch this as many times as you need, uh, because we do get a little technical and we do get a little conceptual and hypothetical here. Um, but we'll get through it and uh, we will be better for it on the other side. So here we are for our first part of chi-square uh, and hypothesis testing. So um, we just finished um, sort of understanding how to construct these frequency tables with, with the rest of the columns, you know, what they mean. Um, and that's great. It, it's, it's great to be able to sort of summarize and describe and visualize those data. But what if we wanted to start making decisions based on these data? Um, more specifically, now that we have observed some frequency of responses in the world, we can start asking questions about whether or not our observations might deviate from what we would expect to occur. So um, there are expectations based on probability in the world all around you, right? So um, when you flip a coin, there is a probabilistic expectation, right? That there's a 50-50 chance for that coin to land on heads or tails, right? Um, and we can use these expected probabilities to compare our observations. So what actually happened in the real world to what probability theory tells us we should expect to happen. Um, think about this, uh, a lot of these examples are are good for uh, like Las Vegas gambling. Um, so uh, if you're playing roulette, uh, roulette is the game where you have the wheel with all the red and black numbers and you spin the wheel and then you put the little white ball, the white ball goes around, it lands in a number and then you can bet on all kinds of things based on um, what number it's gonna land on, whether it's gonna be red or black, um, the exact number, right? Whether the number will be like one to 12, 13 to, 24, whatever, right? Um, so there is an expected probability, right? If there are, um, I think a standard roulette wheel has 32 numbers, plus they usually have a couple of green squares, so it's like 34 um, slots, right? We would expect that there are all kinds of probabilities we can derive from that if we expect that the wheel and the ball, everything is fair, right? One out of every 32, um, spins, you should hit each number. That's the probability of hitting each number. We could then go sit at a roulette table and record the, the observations, what actually happens. And we can compare that to what we know about probability to see if our observations deviate from the expectation. Or in other words, we could mathematically assess whether or not that roulette wheel is fair or whether or not that ball is fair. Um, so that's one of the things we can do with a chi-square test. 
Um, but the important thing here is that chi-square tests are about looking at frequencies. So we, we have a set of data, uh, and then we have the frequencies of those data, uh, and then we wanna make some decision about that data. So there are two kinds of chi-squares that we're gonna learn about this semester. The first is a chi-square goodness of fit test. That's what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, and then the second is a chi-square test of independence. Um, that's gonna be for uh, another lecture. So let's get started with our chi-square goodness of fit. So this is our first foray, like I said, into inferential statistics, the branch of statistics that allows you to draw conclusions from your data and make inferences or claims about the world. Now, um, I want to press pause here for a second, not literally. Um, I want to press pause here for a second and discuss the fears that many people have when it comes to statistics and mathematical calculations. So in this class, if you can do basic algebra, meaning you can add, subtract, multiply, divide, um, use exponents, right, like square or something, or and take a square root. Um, if you can do all of that with a calculator, of course, um, and you can do them all in the correct order of operations, then you can do the math um, for this statistics class. This class does not require you to do any calculations beyond what I've just described. Add, subtract, multiply, divide, exponent, square root, and do it all in the right order. That's it. That's all you have to do. Um, and furthermore, I'm going to be giving you the formulas that you need. You do not have to remember or memorize the formulas. So when people hear statistics, they think math and they get scared of math. Uh, but I'm here to tell you that the calculations are the easy part. The calculations are cake. I'm going to give you the formulas. I'm going to walk you through it. I'm going to show you how to do it. You don't have to worry about the calculations. The difficult part of this class is this place where we move beyond the calculations and we make inferences or claims about the world. The logic of what we call hypothesis testing and, and using the numbers, using the calculations to make a claim or to learn something about the world, that inferential leap, that's gonna be the hard part, I promise you. So learn the math, know the math, but don't be afraid of the math. Uh, what we need to spend a lot of time on as well is sort of the theory, the understanding about how science moves from data to claims and inferences. Uh, and that process is known as hypothesis testing. So uh, we're going to be introducing both of those sort of in tandem. We're going we're gonna to use the chi-square test um, to sort of um, uh, give us our first explanation of how all of that works. Um, the exact math, the calculations, are going to change as we change different statistics, right? As we go from, for example, a chi-square goodness of fit to a chi-square test of independence. Uh, and then later in the semester, we're going to have a single samples t-test. It's another statistic. The math changes, but the math is easy. Um, what doesn't change, what is invariant, what you will need for everything is an understanding of the sort of conceptual way in which a scientist sees the world and makes inferences about the world from their data. That's the hard part, I promise you. So with that in mind, let's move forward. Um, we want to do our chi-square goodness of fit test. What this statistic asks is, do our observed data fit an expected pattern of probabilistic outcomes? So we use this particular statistical test when there is a known probability of an event happening in the world, and we want to compare our observed data, so the things that actually did happen in the world, and compare our observations to this expected standard based on probability. So um, the standard examples are things like the rolling of dice, playing roulette, like I mentioned, uh, the lottery, right? The lottery has expected probabilities. It's numbers from one to whatever, 99 or, you know, 59. I don't know what the lottery is. Don't play the lottery. It's a waste of money. Um, 
you will never win. Um, you're more likely, I think, to be struck by lightning than to like win mega millions. Um, however, you know, if you find yourself in Vegas, um, then understanding probability might be helpful to you. I was actually in Vegas um, at the, the time of this filming, I think about a year ago, a little over a year ago. Uh, and it's quite fun to go to Vegas as a professor of statistics. Uh, you really get to look around and see uh, how people don't understand how probability works, uh, which is kind of fun. Um, did, I think I just admitted to going to Vegas and having fun thinking about probability and statistics rather than actually having fun in Vegas. Um, that's just, a, you know, a personal problem on my part. So um, we use the chi-square goodness of fit test when we want to compare an, ob an observed uh, set of data, so things that happen in the real world, to a standard of existing probability that exists in the world. That's why it works for things like gambling in Vegas, because when you have dice and you're rolling a dice and you're playing craps, there's a known probability. We know the likelihood of a seven rolling, right? We know the likelihood of a 12 rolling because the dice have inherent probability, right? They have six sides and you roll two dice. And so we can calculate the probability. However, there are also um, other situations in the world uh, where this can be the case. For example, uh, let's say that at your job, maybe you work at a restaurant or you work at Starbucks or something. Um, and every day at the end of your shift, uh, your boss says that they choose someone at random to be responsible for taking out the trash. That's just the way your boss handles it. It's not any one person's job. You just kind of rotate randomly um, who, who takes out the trash at the end of each shift. Uh, and on your shift, there are four employees. And you suspect that your boss is playing favorites. Right? You suspect that your boss is in fact not choosing people randomly, but they are uh, preferentially treating some employees and having them take out the trash less than they should. Uh, and they are making other employees take out the trash more often than they should. So what you do is you keep track of who takes out the trash for 100 days. So every day for 100 days, you collect data, you make observations in the world about who is chosen by your boss to take out the trash. And the question you're asking is, are essentially, are your boss's choices random? Are they actually random and fit an expected probability in the world? Um, or is your boss playing favorites? So uh, we're going to introduce the idea of goodness of fit uh, and this statistic, and then we're going to use that to discuss the process of hypothesis testing. So again, at the end of every shift, your boss chooses someone at random to be responsible for taking out the trash. There are four employees per shift. You keep track of who is chosen to take out the trash for 100 days. Um, and the question we're asking is, are your boss's choices random or are they playing favorites? So step one is to establish our expected outcomes. So what that means is if we have four employees and if we have 100 observations, right? So 100 days of who takes out the trash, then we can derive an expected frequency of each employee taking out the trash. Because if your boss is claiming that everyone is equal and that he's choosing randomly, then we can derive an expected probability. So here are our employees, Samantha, Franklin, Becky, and Anthony. We have four employees. And if the boss is choosing randomly, they should each have a one in four probability of being chosen, right? That's that's how probability works, right? This question has an expected, very real probability in the world. Four employees chosen at random should each have a one out of four chance at, at taking out the trash. So the first thing we do is we establish um, the expected probability, in this case, one out of four. 
We have 100 observations, so 100 days. So if we know the expected probability, which is one in four, which we derived based on the number of options, right? There were four options for employees. So that each option, if each option is equally probable, should have a one in four chance. So if everyone has a one in four chance of taking out the trash, and we observed 100 days of taking out the trash, then we simply take the number of days times the probability for each person to derive the fact that if your boss is being equal, everyone should have taken out the trash 25 times. 25 times, that's it, easy, right? One quarter of 100 is 25. So that is our expected outcome. That is the outcome based on pure probability in the world. Now that is not our observations. That is not our data yet. This is simply what we should expect to occur in the world if the world is behaving according to true probability. Every person should take out the trash 25 times. So what we do in terms of decision making for science is we express this idea in terms of what we call the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is basically our starting point in this operation of inference and claim. The null hypothesis is the idea that nothing is happening, meaning that everything is as it should be, or that no one differs, right? The boss is behaving according to probability. So in science, when we ask a question about the world, we always start with the assumption that nothing is going on, right? That the claim is incorrect, that the claim is not true. Um, so if, you're, if you think that your boss is being unfair, then what we do is we start from the point of assuming that your boss is fair. And so if we assume that your boss is fair, that means your boss is picking people at random. And so we are only convinced to move away from the null assumption if the data violate that assumption. Right? So we start from the place of not believing the claim and we only believe the claim if sufficient evidence can be presented. Um, we express this symbolically like this. The H sub zero, the null hypothesis, think about null as meaning nothing, so zero, right? The H sub zero, the hypothesis of nothingness is that person one takes out the trash an equal number of times to person two, who takes out the trash an equal number of times to person three, who takes out the trash an equal number of times to person four. This is a symbolic expression of the idea that we're starting with. The, and the idea that we're starting with is that your boss is doing nothing wrong, right? Nothing is happening. And if nothing is happening, then everyone takes out the trash an equal number of times. So we, we call that the null hypothesis, that no one differs from anyone else. There's null, right? Nothing, zero, nothing's happening. Everyone is equal. So we can think of the null hypothesis. I, I think a good example is the concept of innocent until proven guilty. Um, so if you're making this claim about your boss, that your boss is in fact being unfair, we should only accept that claim if you can provide sufficient evidence, right? You are making the claim and thus you are required to provide the evidence. So essentially your boss is innocent until proven guilty. We start from the assumption that nothing is happening and we only accept the claim if sufficient evidence is provided. 
This makes perfect sense. I mean, this is how you should behave in the world, right? If someone comes up to you and says, the earth is flat, you should be like, well, you know, previous data tell me that the earth is round. Um, I'm not going to believe your claim until you can provide me with evidence, right? Uh, and they will not be able to provide you with evidence because the earth is is not flat, right? The earth is um, a spheroid, right? It's not a perfect sphere. It's spheroid. It's sphere-like, um, not a perfect sphere, FYI. Um, this is important, you know, in science and it's important in day-to-day -day life, right? If someone came up to you and said, um, you know, um, uh, I don't know, what's a fun conspiracy theory these days? Um, the, the Illuminati run the world and it's this shadow organization of powerful people that, you know, um, drink blood and manipulate stock markets and, and, and control world politics and affairs and, and have always done so for hundreds of years. And it's this secret society of the world's elites. Okay, cool. Like maybe, but like, do you have any evidence of that? Right. I, I I'm not just going to believe you because random, you know, Joe Schmo 69 uh, has a YouTube video, right? Like that's stupid. Uh, why would I just believe Joe Schmo 69 because they have a YouTube video that says this, show me evidence, right? Provide sufficient evidence for your claim. So uh, science starts from the place where if you make a claim, we don't believe you, right? We, we withhold our belief until you can provide sufficient evidence. And withholding that belief means that we assume that nothing is happening. We assume that everything is kosher, right? That, that everyone is equal, that, that the probability for everyone, that, that the probability that everyone has chosen to take out the trash is actually what happens, right? That the, the behavior in the world does in fact equal the probability of one over four. So, we're going to assume that your boss is fair. Just because you claim that your boss is not fair doesn't mean that we should believe you. Provide evidence. That's when we will believe you. So the null hypothesis is the conceptual idea of innocent until proven guilty. So let's talk about innocent until proven guilty in the legal system, right? Uh, why is that an important standard? You know, um, because... If we assume that everyone is guilty of everything that they have been charged with, then we will end up with innocent people in jail, right? There will be people. I mean, we already do end up with innocent people in jail. That's no, uh, no mystery. Um, that's a whole different issue. Uh, we don't have time for that one. You could teach a whole class actually on that. That would be kind of fun. Um, but if we assumed that everyone was just guilty to start with, then we would end up with lots of innocent people in jail because we'd be making a false claim uh, and a decision error, right? Um, we would have all these people in jail who should be free. We don't want that um, because that uh, is taking freedom away from someone who deserves to be free. Uh, and so we err on the side of caution and we have this standard of innocent until proven guilty. So we do the same thing in science. Um, if you make a claim, um, your claim is innocent until proven guilty. We are we're going to withhold belief. Um, we are going to withhold judgment until you can provide sufficient evidence. So, um, to sort of hammer home the point, um, let's imagine that um, some pharmaceutical company says, "Hey, look, I have a medicine that cures breast cancer." Um, look, I made it. I have a medicine that cures breast cancer. Uh, we should just, you know, you should go ahead and give me billions of dollars uh, and we should give it to everyone and it'll cure their breast cancer. Um, and th that's great, right? That's That sounds amazing. And, and that's hopefully what pharmaceutical companies are trying to do. Um, but if they make that claim, we require them, right? the federal government requires them to provide evidence of that claim. They have to show clinical trials. They have to show research and studies um, that provide evidence that their medicine does cure breast cancer. Because what would happen if we just believed them, right? If, if we did away with the null hypothesis, if we did away with innocent until proven guilty, which would mean 
that they claim that their drug cures breast cancer, and we just believe them. We don't ask for evidence. We just believe them. Then what would happen in this case, many things would happen. People might take this medicine um, and have side effects that we didn't know about because there were, we, we didn't see the research. Or um, there might be people who we should be recommending to have surgery, to have mastect mastectomies. Uh, I don't know if I pronounced that right. Um, uh, who should be having surgery to remove their breast cancer. Um, but instead of their surgery, we say, oh, look, this new medicine came out. Um, and um, we're going to give you that medicine instead of surgery. Um, and they should be having the surgery, but they end up dying because they don't get the surgery they, they need because we believed the medication without um, evidence of the medication working. So this is really, really important uh, in the real world. Um, and so this concept is, is not just this esoteric BS that we make up to make Psych 3510 difficult for you, right? It, it's really not. This shit is really important uh, and, and serves as this philosophical foundation for a lot of our decision making um, in the real world in these important contexts like medicine um, and um, the justice system. So keeping that in mind, we want to invest in understanding this because it's really, really important. Um, uh, and it will make you a better uh, consumer and producer of research, right? If we go all the way back to chapter one. Okay. So the null hypothesis is that everybody's equal. Let's return to our example. Um, your boss chooses people to take out the trash. You suspect that your boss is playing favorites and that, he, that your boss is not choosing randomly. Your boss is preferring some people over others. We have expressed that in terms of a null hypothesis, which is that everyone was equal. Everyone is taking out the trash equally. Uh, your boss is fair. But then we want to set up against it, right? We want to set against it an alternative hypothesis, what will, all, what will be called either the alternative or the research hypothesis. So this is the, the idea that your boss is playing favorites, right? that your claim is correct, that your boss is not choosing people randomly. We can express that symbolically like this. Uh, the alternative hypothesis, the H1 instead of H0, is that you know the, the probability or that person one is not equal to person two, who's not equal to person three, who's not equal to person four, right? This is the idea that something is going on. Your boss is in fact nefariously choosing certain people to take out the trash um, and others to not take out the trash. So we have two uh, hypotheses. We have the null hypothesis, which says everyone is equal, i.e. your boss is fair. And we want to start with that hypothesis. So what I want you to imagine is that we create that hypothesis and then we hold on to it, right? We, we, we clutch it. It's our little baby. We stay with that hypothesis. We, we start there and we stay there. And we only let it go. We only release the null hypothesis if we are convinced to do so by sufficient evidence. So I want you to notice that these two statements are mutually exclusive, meaning they both cannot be true at the same time. One of them must be the case, right? Either people are equal and your boss is fair, or people are not equal and your boss is not fair. That's it. There's only two situations. Um, so this resolves uh, the reason we want these to be mutually exclusive is so that it can resolve ambiguity in our in our decision making. Um, we we come to a decision and that's the decision. They both can't be true at the same time. One of them has to be the case. Okay, um, I know that was a lot. Uh, it was very conceptual. Uh, if you need to go back and rewatch that in order to sort of get a handle on it, please do. Um, what we're going to do now is move forward with the math of chi-square goodness of fit. 
Uh, here's our formula for chi-square. Uh, it looks scary, but I promise you it's not. I'm going to break it down for you. Chi-square, that's the Greek letter chi. Chi-squared equals the sum of our observed data minus the expected probability squared divided by the expected probability or the expected score, sorry. The observed score minus the expected score. So here are all of the um, uh, definitions of our symbols here. Chi-square, the sum of observed scores and expected scores. Looks scary, uh, but again, there's nothing here beyond addition, subtraction, division, and an exponent. If you can do it and you can do it in the right order, then you know the math is, is nothing beyond middle school algebra, I promise you. Okay, so we take our four um, individuals. We have already established that if we observed 100 days of taking out the trash and we have four people, and if everyone has an equal probability, then everyone should have taken out the trash 25 times. 100 divided by four equals 25. So 25 is gonna be our expected score for everyone. Because if your boss is behaving fairly, and if your boss is acting according to known probabilities in the world, then everyone should equally take out the trash 25 times. So that's E, that's our expected score. E, so sort of looking forward practically in, into the future, um, E is going to be something that you have to derive from the research question. E is not going to be given to you. You have to figure out what E is, and E will change based on the situation. So for example, if instead of four, uh, employees, if there were five employees, then everyone would have a one fifth chance of taking out the trash. And so 100 times one fifth or 100 divided by five means that everyone would take out the trash 20 times. So E would be 20, not 25 if we had five employees. If we only had two employees, then E would be 50 because everyone, if your boss is, is acting according to probability, everyone should take out the trash 50 times. So E will have to be derived by you in order to answer the question correctly based on the information given to you um, in the scenario. O, the observed data will be provided to you because it's a scenario, right? Obviously you're not actually gonna go out in the world and observe these data. Um, I will give you the, uh, the fictional observed data uh, as part of the question, as part of the scenario. So O for each option, right, will always be provided in the question. E, you will have to calculate, you will have to figure out. So let's say in this scenario, you observed the following data for taking out the trash. Samantha, and remember in the 100 days that, um, that you made your observations, Samantha took out the trash 40 times. Franklin took out the trash 15 times. Becky took out the trash 20 times. And Anthony took out the trash 25 times. So what we're essentially gonna do here is compare the observed data, what actually happened in the real world. We're gonna mathematically compare that to our expected probability, our expected um, score um, based on probability theory. So we're gonna take each individual and we're going to plug them into this formula. And then we're going to sum all of the results. So we're gonna do this step-by-step step, one by one really slowly for you. We need to plug in each person's value into the equation. And then we need to keep track of each individual's resulting numbers. And then we have to do this guy, this sigma, we have to add them all up. Okay, here's another breakdown. Um, we have in the numerator, 
the everyone's observed value minus their expected value squared divided by their expected value. That's going to give us uh, an intermediate number for each uh, person. And then we're going to sum those intermediate numbers, and that's going to give us our uh, chi-square value. So again, to break it down uh, further, we do this part for every person. We record those numbers, so we'll end up with four intermediate numbers. And then we add up those four numbers, one for each of our employees. So let's do that step by step. We'll take Samantha. We observed Samantha taking out the trash 40 times. So that goes where the O goes, 40 minus E. We would have expected Samantha to, to take out the trash 25 times. So it looks like Samantha is taking out the trash more than she should, right? Um, she took it out 40 times. We would have expected her to take it out 25 times. So 40 minus 25 is 15. We square 15 to get 225. And then divide by E, right? We just follow the formula. So 225 divided by 25 gives us a 9 for Samantha. Let's look at that again. Samantha scored a 40 in our observed data. We would have expected Samantha to score a 25. So we're going to do 40 minus 25 squared and then divide by 25, right? So we're just doing this portion of the formula for Samantha. 40 minus 25 squared divided by 25. 40 minus 25 is 15. 15 squared is 225. 225 divided by 25 is 9. Boom. So that's Samantha's chi-square contribution. You can think of it that way. Samantha contributes nine chi-square points to the chi-square. So then we just do this for every person. We repeat this uh, for Franklin. Franklin took out the trash 15 times. We would have expected Franklin to take out the trash 25 times. 15 minus 25 is negative 10. That negative sign is going to go away because we square it. So that's 100 divided by 25 means Franklin contributes four to the um, chi-square. Becky took out the trash 20 times. We would have expected her to take it out 25 times. 20 minus 25 is negative five squared is 25. 25 divided by 25 is one. Lastly, Anthony took out the trash exactly as many times as we would have expected him to. He took it out 25 times. We would have expected him to take it out 25 times. 25 minus 25 is zero. Zero squared is zero. Zero over 25 is zero. So we now have each of our chi-square contributions for uh, each of our participants or each of our employees. So we have essentially done the right portion of the formula for each individual. So all we have to do is sum all of those numbers and we get our chi observed chi-square value. So 9 plus 4 plus 1 plus 0 is 14. We have a chi-square of 14. And you're done. <coughs> Excuse me. I told you the math is easy. The math is not the hard part. You didn't believe me, um, but it's true. Um, all that shit we talked about, the hypotheses and decision-making and innocent until proven guilty, that's the hard part. This is the easy part. Just do some algebra. As long as you can do the algebra, you're fine. The hard part is the decision-making. Uh, if you need to go back and look at this again, uh, I, if I move too quickly for you, Please rewind um, and, and make sure you understand where all these numbers came from. Uh, if you have any questions about that, about the calculations, please feel free to reach out and contact me. Uh, unfortunately, we usually have a, a psychology help center uh, dedicated to 3510 and 3530. Um, in the semester that I'm making this video, um, we do not. Um, but in the future, uh, if you're watching this at some point in the future, 
um, then there should be a help center that you can also go and get help at. Okay, so um, we just did some algebra for each person to get our uh, chi-square values for each person. We add them up and we get our resulting um, final chi-square obtained of 14. But let's take a second and let's notice something interesting about the individual contributions of chi-square. Notice how the more that an individual deviates from the expected value, the greater their contribution to the chi-squared statistic. So we see that Samantha deviated the most, right? She deviated by 15. She took out the trash 15 more times than she should have. And so she contributes the largest value to our chi-square versus Anthony, who took out the trash exactly as many times as he was supposed to, so he contributes nothing to our chi-square. He gives zero value to the chi-square. We can see that Becky gives some value to the chi-square, but she was pretty close, right? She, she was supposed to take out the trash 25 times. She only took it out 20. That's pretty close. Um, and so she contributes a small amount. Franklin contributes a moderate amount because he was supposed to take it out 25 times. He was 10 away from that. He took it out only 15, so he contributes four. So the more, so if, if my hand here represents the idea of our expected value, the more you deviate from the expected value in either direction, the greater your contribution to chi-square. So Samantha varies a lot from her expectations, so she contributes the most. Anthony varies the least, right, none, so he contributes nothing. Becky varies a little bit, she contributes a small amount to our chi-square. So what does that mean for chi-square? What it means is that when we sum and get a single value of chi-square, in this case 14, the value of chi-square represents the amount of deviation from expectation. So the larger our chi-square, the greater the total deviation from our expected probabilities. The smaller our chi-square value, the less deviation there is from our expected probabilities. So the larger our chi-square is, the more likely it is that our boss is not being fair, right? Because we, we are deviating from the expected probability. If we have a small chi-square, then it means that our observations are very close to our expectations. So in this example, a small chi-square would tell us that our boss is in fact fair. Everyone is equal because we're not deviating from the expectation. A large chi-square would tell me that our boss is not fair. Right? Something is going on because we have a lot of deviation from our expected probability. So big chi-square means our people are, uh, in this case, our employees do in fact differ. Small chi-square would mean they do not differ. Chi-square is basically the um, cumulative amount of deviation from the expected probability. So <clears throat> the next question is how do we decide to make a decision? I just told you that we have a chi-square of 14. Is that big or small? Right? We, we need some standard to compare our chi-square to. So we need some way, some standardized way of saying, listen, I got a chi-square of 14. Is that a big chi-square or is that a small chi-square? Because that standard of decision making is going to tell me what I should do about my hypotheses. Um, we need some kind of line in the sand, right? We need some hurdle um, to either clear or not clear uh, that will tell us uh, what decision we should make. 
So is 14 a large chi-square or is 14 a small chi-square? Uh, and how do we know? So before we get into that, uh, get into how we do that, we have to discuss um, probability sort of in an abstract sense. Uh, so we're gonna discuss probability and then we'll probably cut the video um, and, and pick up with part two after that for, for how we make this decision about chi-square. So important, we're gonna discuss probability and in discussing probability, we're doing so, so that we can understand um, how we make the decision about whether 14 is a small or a large chi-square. Okay, um, in science, we are convinced by occurrences that are unlikely, that are improbable. So here's the example we're gonna use. I, Dr. Sellers, claim that I am capable of manipulating the flip of a coin such that it always lands on heads. That's my claim. I can flip a coin and make it land on heads, whether that's, you know, some trick with my mind um, or I have some like really cool technique with my thumb or something, um, whatever it is, I, I'm making the claim that I can flip a coin and always make it land on heads. So again, innocent until proven guilty, you should start by saying bullshit. No, I do not believe you. Bullshit, Dr. Sellers. I'm going to start with the null hypothesis, which is that the number of heads you will flip is equal to the number of tails you will flip, right? Because there's an equal probability of flipping a head, heads or a tails, right? Because if my claim was bullshit, then this should be the case. Right? This is what we should observe in the world. I am only going to move away from that hypothesis if you can provide sufficient evidence and convince me of the alternative hypothesis, which is that your frequency of heads is greater than your frequency of tails, right? That's, that would be the scientific way to approach my claim. You call bullshit on my claim. You refuse to believe my claim. You set up a null hypothesis that the heads are equal to the tails. Uh, and you only believe me if I can provide you with sufficient evidence that I can flip more heads than tails and thus have you support the research hypothesis. Uh, this is how you should behave in the real world, right? Um, when people make claims, force them to provide evidence of their claims. So I'm going to try and convince you that I can in fact make heads, make a coin uh, land on heads. However, not all evidence is created equally. Uh, and I'm gonna show you that you are convinced by improbable occurrences, or basically uh, if I can produce a state of the world that is unlikely, that unlikelihood is what makes you more convinced. So for example, I flip my coin one time, a single flip, it lands on heads and I go, see, I can make coins land on heads. Are you convinced of my claim? Is that evidence convincing? I flipped the coin one time and it landed on heads. Of course that's not convincing, right? You, you should not be convinced because there's a 50-50 chance that it lands on heads. What if I did it five times in a row, right? I flipped five coins and they all landed on heads. At this point, you might be going, maybe there's something to it. Um, but you're probably not super convinced. You're like, you know, five is, is possible, right? I mean, we could calculate the probability. It's, it's 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 times 0 0.5. It's small, um, 
but it, it's possible. It, it would not be inconceivable for someone to flip a coin five times and have it land on heads, right? It's going to happen. So you're probably not super convinced um, by that either. What if I flipped a coin 100 times and 100 times in a row it landed on heads? Suddenly, my claim is starting to look pretty good, right? This evidence of 100 flips is much better evidence for my, my claim that I can make coins land on heads. It's much better evidence than these other occurrences. And lastly, if I could somehow flip a coin 1,000 times and 1,000 times in a row, it landed on heads, I imagine you would be like, well, shit, I guess you can do it, right? Like, what other choice do you have? I just did it a 1,000 times. The probability of that happening is basically zero, right? It's, it's like 0.5 to the thousandth power. It's nothing. Right. It's it's, you know, uh, thousands of zeros right uh, behind the decimal point there. It, it's ridiculous. It would be a ridiculous occurrence. It's absolutely uh, against the laws of probability for me to be able to do that. You would be convinced right? if I flipped a coin 1000 times and it landed on heads 1000 times in a row, that would convince you that I can, in fact, manipulate the flip of a coin. So why is this one convincing? Why is the thousand times convincing, but the one in the five time isn't? Well, it's because flipping a coin and having it land on heads a thousand times is highly unlikely to occur, right? The, the essence of why you're convinced is because I have produced an unlikely event in the direction of my claim. I claimed that I can do something, I can make a coin land on heads. And then I did it in, a, in an extremely unlikely occurrence. So flipping it one time is highly probable. It's very likely to occur. It happens all the time. So it's not convincing to you. But a thousand times is very unlikely. It's highly improbable and thus it's convincing. And the more improbable it gets, the more convincing it is, right? So if I did, if I flipped the coin 10,000 times, it would be even more convincing because the probability of that happening is even smaller. So in science, we are convinced by occurrences that are unlikely, that are improbable when they occur in the direction of the claim. And my claim was that I can make coins land on heads. So we're convinced by highly unlikely occurrences in the direction of the claim. That's what makes evidence convincing. So what we need for our chi-square is a way to evaluate the likelihood of our observed chi-square. And so that's what we're going to do. So let's talk about... Um, if we have that evidence, um, how do we make decisions about a hypothesis? So let's imagine that I, I did the thousand coin flips and I got them all heads. Um, and I have in fact convinced you that I can manipulate the flip of a coin by the data I provide, right? You are convinced I have provided improbable uh, occurrences in the direction of my hypothesis. Remember, you started with the null hypothesis. You you created the null and you you held on to it tightly, right? That I have that my heads should be equal to my tails. That's your starting point. You're innocent until proven guilty. And so I have convinced you. So what you have to do is reject the null. You let go of the null, and we support the alternative hypothesis that I can make heads. Uh, more likely than tails, right? And you conclude that I can manipulate the flip of a coin. So the terminology here is very important. Uh, we want to reject the null hypothesis when we are convinced. Because remember, the null hypothesis is the idea that nothing is happening, that 
the state of probability in the world is actually what's occurring, right? Nothing is going on. And so if we are convinced by the claim, if we are convinced that the observations are deviating from the expected probabilities, then we reject the null hypothesis. We reject the idea that things are equal and we support the idea that something is happening, right? The, that the claim is correct. Um, this is an artifact of terminology, but it is very important. We do not want to use the, the terms prove and disprove. Um, the reason we don't want to use those terms is because they, they imply that the matter is is closed and shut and that and that science can just move on um, and, and it, it never needs to be investigated again. But that's not how science works. Science is constantly checking itself. Science is constantly correcting itself. Science is constantly coming up with new methods, new technologies, new statistics, um, new ideas. Um, and that can change our old way of thinking, right? Um, you know, there are lots of things in the field of psychology that we believed in the 60s and the 70s that we don't believe anymore. Uh, and, and science in general, right? Um, it changes. Uh, people who don't understand science will often um, use that fact as a way to disparage science and, and to ignore science. Because, uh, you know, like, oh, it, you know, it changes every week. Those scientists don't know what the hell they're doing. Um, but in fact, that's the way good science is done. We, we want to change. Uh, we want to update our knowledge um, as new things happen, as new technologies, new methods, new data exist. We don't want to be rigid and invariant. Uh, we want to be flexible and capable of incorporating new knowledge and new information into our, uh, our worldview and our understanding. So that flexibility, the fact that science does change what science thinks and believes means science is working because we are uh, taking baby steps to approximate the truth, right? To get closer and closer to the truth. That change, those baby steps is the, the art of science. That's what makes it so valuable. Um, it, that's what makes it different from dogma, right? From um, rigid invariant belief. Rigid invariant belief is dangerous uh, because the world changes uh, and, and new things come about. Um, if you are so rigid and stuck in your ways and your beliefs um, that you refuse to change them, um, then you're dogmatic and, and, and your ideas will likely be left behind um, because new information and, and new data will uh, will change the way that we should think about the world. Um, you know, one of the, one classic example is um, a, a famous astronomer uh, or astrophysicist uh, named Hubble. Uh, you might recognize that name from the Hubble telescope. Um, the Hubble telescope is this was, it's not the most powerful thing anymore, but at the time when it went up, I think in like the eighties, um, maybe the early nineties, uh, it was the strongest, most capable, most powerful um, satellite telescope that we had. It was peering out into the, the known stretches of the universe, uh, collecting data. It was named after Hubble uh, because Hubble is the physicist who um, made this startling discovery that the universe is bigger um, than we thought it was, essentially. Um, so physicists thought that the universe was a certain size uh, and that we could know and measure that size. Uh, and then Hubble discovered, nope, the universe is giant. It's, it's massive. And in fact, we know now the universe is, is, is basically infinite. It's, it's expanding. Um, it, it is always changing and always getting bigger. Um, so if you go back 100 years, 500 years, you, know, you don't have to go back that far. 100 years, 150 years, science believed that the universe was a certain size. Um, and then it, it changed, right? We got new technology. We got better computer. We got computers. We got better optics. We got better telescopes. We got better data. We got faster ways of crunching those numbers. Um, and so 
the worldview of science or the universe view of science adjusted for that. Um, it science looked at itself and it said we were wrong, right? We know from these new data, from these new technologies, um, that what we used to think is no longer the case. Uh, and so now we need to update uh, our views. And that's powerful um, because that's how we advance. That's how we change. That's how we progress. Um, and so we don't want to use the words prove and disprove because prove and disprove implies that we're not going to change, right? That, that we're stuck in, in this knowledge. And that's just not the case. So what we want to do, because it is philosophically important to do so, uh, we want to use the terms reject and support, um, not prove and disprove. Now, if we are unconvinced of the claim, so remember, my claim was that I can manipulate the flip of a coin such that it lands on heads. You create your null hypothesis, which is that my claim is bullshit, right? Your, your null hypothesis should be that nothing is happening, that my heads are equal to my tails, and we hold that uh, null hypothesis. So I, if I attempted to provide you evidence and you are unconvinced of the claim, then you keep the null hypothesis, right? You don't let it go. You fail to reject it. You hold on to it. It's, it's strange terminology. I understand that that's difficult. It's basically like a weird double negative. But we're just think of it in this terms and I promise it'll make it easier. When you create a null hypothesis, you hold it. If you're convinced by the evidence, then you reject the null. If you are unconvinced by the evidence, you fail to reject it. You keep the null. And so what we would conclude is that Dr. Sellers has not presented evidence that he's able to manipulate the flip of a coin because in fact, his heads were equal to his tails. So we fail to reject and we retain the null hypothesis versus rejecting the null hypothesis when we are convinced. Okay, we're going to stop here. Uh, I'm going to cut the recording and we'll pick this up with part two. Um, basically what you see in front of you and what we'll talk about at the beginning of part two is um, how do we make this decision with a chi-square? Because we have a chi-square right now of 14 and we need some benchmark. We need some way to know whether 14 was probable or whether 14 was improbable. We need to know, should we reject or should we fail to reject our null hypothesis? That's what we're, where we're going to pick up uh, with part two. Uh, part two will finish this example, and then we'll go through a whole other example um, so that we get some more practice with it. So thanks, everybody. Um, and I will see you next time to finish up the chi-squared goodness of fit test. Have a good one.